indeed, indeed. Yeah, no, indeed, indeed. Or there's action until it's really hard and you really don't want to go. And then you should even then then you really have to then 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 the, then the true entrepreneurial spirit comes out. You know, in those moments where you really don't want to show up and you must. Hello and welcome to another edition of Expedition Business, where we share stories of the highs and lows of our inspirational entrepreneurs and how on earth they managed to keep the flame of business adventure burning. My name is Christelle Rosley Fenter, and today I have a privilege of talking to Jules Harris, founder of The Real Food Factory. But before we get to Jules, I want to remind you to please subscribe to the Expedition Business Podcast on your favorite podcast channel and share it with all your friends and family. Today's episode is made possible by New Echo Solar. Because life is too short for load shedding nightmares and you will have an opportunity to live a greener life. Visit them at new spelt nu echosolar.co.za or check out the description box for more details on new echo solar. But back to Jules. Jules is a 70s child, born in London, studied the Chinese language at Leeds University, lived in China for three years while she was learning how to grow shiitake mushrooms, and eventually moved to wilderness in the Western Cape, one of the best places in the world to grow this special fungi. She currently lives in Komiki in Cape Town, where she runs her vegan, sustainable and eco-friendly food company, The Real Food Factory. Jules, welcome to Expedition Business. Uh, hello, thank you. I'm excited to be here. Very nice to be here. Fantastic. And you say the weather in Cape Town is amazing today. Yeah, it's a beautiful, clear, clear Cape Town day. It really is really excellent. Just something that amazes me, you've had quite a journey, but I'd like to know how on earth did you choose to settle in South Africa? Surely there must be lots of other places where you can grow shiitake mushrooms. Yes, no, that's indeed, that's quite, that's quite an interesting one because uh, my early life, I was quite a traveler. Ob obviously, you know, I studied lang uh, for, like Asian languages, so that took me to the east. And then I lived in India for a long time and then I stayed in South America a little bit and I, and I lived in Australia as well. But when I, I came to South Africa in 1998, the first time, and uh, my personality is that anyway to go to rather a little bit further along the road or to somewhere a little bit more extraordinary. So my first years in South Africa, I only visited from I would arrive in Johannesburg and I only really got as far as uh, the Eastern Cape. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was the place that I traveled the most and it really captured my heart from that side of things. Just meeting all the different South African people and yeah, that side of the journey before it got all serious and businessy, yeah, on visits. So that, that was the journey of actually why I, I, I visited. Um, and then uh, when I did, was looking for somewhere to live, as it says in the, my bio, you know, uh, the growing shiitake on outdoor logs, it was a premier place to um, move to. Uh, so in the garden route. So, uh, yeah, Wilderness National Park seemed a good place to settle. That was in 2002. So it's quite a while ago. Yeah. And then. At what point did you start making products from all the shiitake mushrooms? Okay, well, this is a beautiful story and I, I do love to tell it. I don't get enough chance to tell it. So I want to say on this journey, it's not like I, I woke up one morning and decided I wanted to be a food manufacturer. And I would say that that's a very common journey. A lot of us started growing a little something and then we found, uh, for me, for example, uh, so I was in wilderness and I was one of the signature traders at the very 
infamous wild oats farmers market and i started there in 2005 and i stood there with my table full of uh, some shiitake mushrooms some oyster mushrooms some masitake mushrooms that i'd grown and i was so proud of these mushrooms and no one bought them and i went again and no one bought them and this went on for uh, a few months one because they were very costly uh, compared to and two because um, no one really knew what they were in those days as well. You know, they're very more health conscious people did, but it wasn't as mainstream as shiitake is today. Anyway, um, what actually happened and the truth of my changes on about the, the, the third month of me doing markets, a lady came up to me and she said, Jules, uh, my uh, eight year old son has leukemia and I have read, uh, this was in very early research, uh, that uh, the shiitake mushrooms have a great alkaloid in them, which is very, uh, people going for chemo, less nauseous, and it makes uh, people living alongside cancers uh, less sick, generally. Mm -hmm. Can you create a, a, a flavor for me? Because it's, it's quite an earthy flavor, shiitake, and it's not something that children would like. Can, can, you, can you make something for me that he will eat from the shiitake? So I went home in a, a bit of a, a like a, a tiz and I thought, OK, what have I got in my garden? And I bought some pecan nuts, fresh pecan nuts from the market. And I had a little olive oil and I had some fresh Italian parsley uh, in my garden. And I put my first product together, which was my shiitake pesto. I blanched the mushrooms. And so that I feel is quite a eloquent story of how I was forced from my harvest to realize that it needed to have a different format to be able to make it something commercial and that's how the the, the heart of the food brand started um, yeah so that's that's I know long but that's the story yeah so anyway yeah and 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 it, and it was something and the shiitake pesto is still a product that a lot of it, 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 it's such a versatile product that so many different types of people, even those that don't like mushrooms, enjoy it. It's a very extraordinary product. Yeah. Anyway. But I suppose most people buy it for its flavor, not necessarily for the medicinal purposes. No, indeed. Indeed. They they definitely buy it for its flavor. Um, that That's just a story about how it kind of how it started as such. You know, I have 13 different lines that I manufacture, all very original flavors, not all with shiitake as well. We use like superfoods and yeah, lots of other stuff. But in the meantime, you've raked up a couple of accolades like the Good Food and Wine Best New Concept Award. Tell us about that. Yeah, no, we won a, we, I, I, we won a few awards over the year. My first award was again when I was just a tiny little market brand at the Wild Oats and uh, the Great Taste Award came to South Africa and that was 4,000, that was in 2009 and from 4,000 entries in the condiment department I won uh, the best new condiment with my shiitake, lemon and ginger chutney. So that was a huge first accolade because that was a totally anonymous a competition it you know i loved that that it didn't matter who you were and i won above many of the big brands being no one just a little market stall and that win projected me to my first ever food show which i couldn't have ever afforded which was the sunday times food show in 2009 yeah uh which until things kind of fell apart in about 2017 with uh, the good food and wine show and some of the other food shows um uh but i was a huge part of the the food circuits of of all the big food shows good food and wine shows and the taste festivals and the soweto wine and cheese festival and yeah we were a huge part of all of that as well and at those shows we would win best stand design we would win best new product um i also won in 2012 uh, uh one of the uh, Cape Design Awards for the mu some mushroom boxes. I've created some oyster mushroom boxes. Um, yeah, we've won a few things. We've won a few things. But, uh, yeah, that's not as important as the fact that our, our taste profile is still as good as it was when we started and we haven't really, you know, changed our, 
our journey two months, even though we're much bigger than we were. Yeah. You're not just a little table at a food market anymore. Yeah, I know, I know. Hard to get past that as well. Yeah, yeah. But anyway. Yeah. Do you miss those days? I do miss those days. I think there's always a nostalgia to missing everything that was in the past anyway. Um, but for me, the market, I mean, 18 years of farmer's market, signature trader at Wild Oats in Sedgefield, a signature trader at the Aranjizik Farmer's Market. Um, yeah, I'm proud of my work there and making them popular. I mean, it's through personalities like me and others that went to the market in the rain, no matter what. And I, I still think of all of those people. We're a huge family and it's also set me up to be oh, quite well respected in the food world as well as to have quite amazing connections you know, rather than just coming from a corporate space and saying, oh, I have all the connections to set up a food brand. There's something much more authentic mm -hmm. about coming from a market space. And I have met many people. So I think I I think I can say that without sounding too sort of noxious in any way. You know, <laughs> I yeah. can imagine. Yeah, I have my I have my points, my my food points. Yeah. Up, up. Yeah. So, yeah. Jules, do you believe that having lived in China for three years have had any influence on the way you do business or not really? Oh, that's such an interesting question. Well, I was there as a, as a student. So we have to remember that was 91 to 93. So I haven't worked. My food is inspired by my time that I lived there. Um, but I wouldn't say I don't have big yeah, I wouldn't say that it has uh, influence on the way that I do business. I think more the question would be is how has my time in Africa uh, changed the way I do business coming from a background of being a Londoner? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that is is an extraordinary journey. And then, of course, I get my friends visit when when they can from all over the world to our business people all over the world. And they also think it's quite extraordinary, the resilience of what we have to put up with here compared to other places in the world. It would take a whole another podcast to go on about that. So I'll keep the answer short. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I think, okay, shall we make a note for the next podcast on that topic? Yeah, we can make it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I do get a lot of opportunity to speak my mind. Um, I'm often asked to talk in... Uh, with with different government in, officials in agri processing, mm -hmm. so and then some big sustainability managers of big supermarkets. So the biggest thing about my growth and one of the the, the best things about it is I can actually make some uh, big opinions, which may make a small change on a bigger level more than I could as just a little market trader. You know? Yeah. So what would be one of those opinions? Uh, one of those opinions is that here we have all this agricultural offtake, many farmers that want to sell their stuff to food manufacturers. Then we have food manufacturers that want to grow and there is no funding for helping them. Mm. There is no funding for uh, crossing food safety barriers. There is no funding for really mentoring and growing the entrepreneurism of product and I, I speak of that because that's the part that I'm in so we have all this agricultural everyone wants to be a farmer but what are we doing with all that what, what's happening we, we, do you see what's happening where's the where's the process what's happening we've got a huge meeting next week with the, the Cape government about exactly this where, where why is there this gap between the agri-processing uh, the, the, the agriculture offtake and the agri-processing, you know, facilities being able to uh, capture it all, etc. So, yeah, it's interesting. Very interesting comment that you make there. We've actually just had a power hour session this week on the topic of funding. And as per the government, there's a whole list of agencies where you can apply for funding, but um, doesn't sound like they're working. Um, well, and, and, and to be honest, um, I can speak this. I've, I've done another round of applications 
this year alone. Okay, and the point is, if you are whatever whatever small business you are, and I don't just I'm not just uh, it's, it's 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 not just one story, but if you survived COVID and your doors are still open, surely there should be some recognition for that. But all of these funding agencies look into the past. They don't look into your exponential future that can be. It's the same as the banks in this country. They market that they want to help you. It's all great advertising, but when you actually get down to it, they want to see that you you, you, you never pissed Mr. Payment or that your rent was perfectly on time or that you're this and you're that. And it's all inconceivable and moments that could have been considering what's gone on in the world the last three years. So good luck to anyone that actually tries to get funding now because it all is just a pretty picture of what, I don't know, keeping people's jobs in those sectors so they have something to do. I'm not actually sure. I would love to see the proof of how many uh, people are actually getting funded because every single person I know that's trying is getting turned down. That's not good news, but it sounds like you are involved with a number of smaller entrepreneurs that you help and mentor. Yes, I do. I do. Um, I was quite, well, I built this magnificent facility, which was opened at the end of de December 2019. Um, and so therefore, when COVID hit in March 2020, there was many, a couple of other small vegan brands that turned to me uh, had, that had lost their facilities and obviously couldn't keep going. So um, I would provide a mentoring, what I call a dark kitchen. So I would uh, kind of, um, you know, I would I would make their product with my girls under my facility, helping them uh, so that they could still sell their product without having to manufacture anymore. Like a small co-packing idea to go going forward, okay. to go through um, through that experience. When I started to look into some of the biggest food companies in the world and their business models, actually the way that they do survive is by co-packing for other brands. It's very rare that you'll find one brand in one factory and the capacity can be full from that. It actually doesn't work. This is also, that's a huge lesson I've had to also learn along the way. To go into co-branding? Um, to, to go into, uh, yeah, to try to find other signature brands, smaller people than you that can work along and, and, and can also work through your facility. Okay. Speaking of that, you are also involved with brands like Babylon Sturin. We do quite, um, we do some white labeling. We do white, we do, we've, we've just designed our first product in, when was it released? I think in March yes. with uh, Babylon Sturin, very exciting product. Um, so they make this most wonderful Buffalo cream cheese. And uh, when they found me, um, they said, OK, Jules, we hear you make the best pesto in Cape Town. We want you to create something for us that will uh, collaborate with our cream cheese. And so I went back to the drawing board and designed something for them. And, yeah, there's a beautiful cream cheese on the market, which is a collaboration. So that is white labelled, obviously, under uh, the Babylon Sturin label. And then the same goes for food lovers. I've been on the food lovers uh, market shelves for three. No, I'm going into my third year. And so there's six lines. There's six lines on the shelves there. Uh, uh, the hemp and coriander pesto, the basil pesto. It's all in the fridge there. And they that is all real food factory brand, but branded under home brand pesto. So um, I know you're a business post podcast, so I just want to, can I quickly tell a story about, about that? Because I think it's important to share. Please. So um, I very quickly want to share about my, my pitch to food lovers market, because I think it's an important one. And I think uh, small entrepreneurs wonder what it's like and what, what, how, how ready do you have to be to go and pitch to a buyer of a national supermarket? So I say three three things that you have to be be ready. Obviously, um, the the first thing is that your supply chain has to be ready. 
You can't mm-hmm. go from making 20 jars of basil pesto to making 2,000 jars of basil pesto a week and not have the basil and not have the nuts and not have the oil. Do you see what I mean? The second thing you've got to be ready with is to have a facility that can keep to their, to, that can, that, that can, that can um, sorry, that, can, that, that keeps up with the audited legislation that you need mm. to, to do that. And then the third thing that you need to have is a good financial partner because however much you think it's going to cost, it's not going to cost that much. And the growth is just extraordinary. I actually can't even believe that I'm still open every day. Wow. When I walk into my factory, I'm so proud of, the, of just that fact that the doors are open. So th- those, are, those are the three things before you go that it, 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 it's non-negotiable. Um, when, when I went to Pitch Food Lovers, um, I had the other two things. What I what I didn't have is the factory, but I had a way of raising the money to get the factory, and I had things in line, knowing that I was ready to action that if I got the order. Okay. So that's the way I did it. As I went to get the order, and they said yes to the first six lines. Uh, this uh-huh. was in the March of t- t- 2019. Remember, I have no factory. I'm in 20 square meters in Woodstock and I'm at the market. That's all I had at that moment. Um, and they say, yes, Jules, OK, we want to t- take you. Get your factory. Th- I don't know if they even thought I was going to manage it. Then I then I actually went to speak to a mentor and a friend of mine. And he said, you know what, Jules, what you actually should do is to go back to Food Lovers um, and you should pitch to them that you actually want to be their home brand. And I said, why would I do that? I want to get real food factory brand out there, and I'm a small person. Why would I want to go under someone else's name? So basically, um, they said, to, uh, so I went back, and I actually pitched to to be the home brand, and that was because I actually, um, there was a lot of, advantages to being that um because i was was, uh, i was a a new small company entering my first supermarket i found that the logistics were a lot easier being a home brand um i've found that my allowances were more manageable being a home brand i felt the attention to the my marketing of the home brand is obviously it's in the interest of the supermarkets to advertise their home brands so they're going to punt it in their Instagram posts and their, you know, and all their social media stuff, basically. Yes, yes. So the other thing is, you know, as a new brand, when you go in, obviously you're going to be shoved at the bottom of a shelf if you're real food factory. You, you, you know what I mean? You have to stand your time. You have to stand your ground. Mm-hmm. As the home brand, I was put immediately at eye level. Obviously, I had to have strict merchandising to to make sure it's there. And that's still a journey with all of that. But generally, I'm I'm really pleased with the way that I negotiated that journey. Um, A little sub thing of that is, you know, when investors are looking at you, I've learned that they're actually only looking at the number of units that you sell. They're actually not looking at whether you're real food factory or home brand pesto food lovers market. They want to know what your turnover is, what you did and why you're not doing better. It's incredibly harsh, but that's the truth that I found, you know. So, yeah, volume, volume, volume. That's what has to happen to grow. Yeah. We spoke about in the beginning that um, you've obviously started from farmers markets and having a table and the whole artisan feel being involved with investors that's only interested in numbers. How does that affect you as a person? It's hectic. It's hectic. I'd say it's my biggest failing is being able uh, to negotiate uh, well with investors. Um, um, I am very uh, much... Uh, a passionate food philosopher and futurist of food. I'm passionate about our food security, our food waste, um, and therefore it Uh makes me uh, a little unable to negotiate. So what I do is I employ people cleverer than myself now (laughs) to negotiate for me. 
because I know my weakness is that having kicked out some very famous investors out of my factory because um, money isn't everything. I love the saying that Einstein, who is, who is, who is more important, the person with the ideas or the money? I'm sure he didn't say that exactly, but just to round it off into an entrepreneurial. And I, 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 I bring that into my, it, it is actually almost one of my, my mantras when I question where I am, because if you are passionate and it's a good idea and it's original, then the money will come. Maybe not on the day that you want it, probably not, but it will come. Yeah. But I suppose working with brands like Bubbly on Stirring, you sort of get that whole philosophy back into the scheme of things. Yes, yes, yes. So, I mean, you have all different experiences with all different clients. I mean, let's talk about clients of mine, like oh, for over 12 years, Peregrine Farm Stall, the food barn in Nurduk. Um, they're just amazing, amazing uh, Jacksons in Johannesburg. It's been my client for over 15 years. These people are people that have supported Real Food Factory from the time we didn't even have a label on our jar. And really incredible stores where, yeah, I'm still in touch with their their um, the owners, um, and um, uh, their, the the staff that work for them. Very interestingly, one one way I look at companies is is uh, are your are your two CIs are your are your staff always turning over or are they still there? Mm. And when when you look at when you look at some of these key beautiful places like the three that I've just mentioned those staff are still there my staff range from 18 the the youngest 18 years the oldest member the youngest member uh, I think five years now yeah five years is the youngest member of staff yeah 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 oh sorry we just brought on a new customer services girl who's been there Mm. four months but uh, do you know what I mean we did I I think it's I think it's very important to look at that, you know, and, and that's something I've learned as well. You know, before you go into business with people, have a look at how they treat their yes. people and what that means. Yeah, it doesn't matter if they're a big company or not. How are they treating their people, you know, and then you know how they're going to treat you. Yeah. Mm, lots of truth in that. But tell me, yeah. it sounds like apart from dealing with investors, you almost always on top of a world. What is it that really helps you to get motivated, to stay motivated and just to continue with that energy that you work and live by? Um, okay, I would say I would say key things for me are this. So when I when I wrote the original business plan, I always look back on it in 2009 for Real Food Factory. It was actually it was actually about how how can we how can we grow the agricultural offtake of the farmers and really put it in a bottle and maybe even one day export these products so that we're actually growing jobs in South Africa. So that was that was one part of the journey. And that I'm super proud to say has happened, you know. Or, or every, every, um, on a Saturday morning, I'll get a little WhatsApp from one of my farmers in the Cape Flats and he'll send me a little video. I can send it on to you of 10 boys planting coriander seeds in the field. So that's the, 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 the jobs down the line throughout the, 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 the chain of Real Food Factory, you know, from seed to the actual bottle is quite extraordinary. Uh, the other thing I see, as I say, in my strength, the other thing I love as I grow bigger, there's much more people listening to me as the brand gets bigger. And that can bring sustainable change for all of those things I already mentioned with the food waste, everything from single use packaging to what we're doing with our food waste. Yes. And then the third thing is I love South Africa and I just believe in it. You know, you can hear with my accents and my Ah, resilience and my opinionated ways that I probably could be anywhere in the world but I choose to be here I choose to be here because we can make some great changes no matter what here we really can and I and I can see it I can really see it fantastic so do you ever feel like things are not going your way you need to re-motivate yourself do you ever 
have those moments we <laughs> like every morning or are you saying like more than once a day or or just just once I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sure I'm part of the 5 a.m club I can seriously suggest that huh you get up okay you meditate you go for a walk you make your beds you get on with it you move forward that's that's the deal there is no other way yeah there is no other way if you do get your down moments, apart from mm -hmm. if you get your down moments in the middle of a day, how do you get through them? I actually walk out of my factory. There's a beautiful estuary okay. in Capricorn Park okay. and I walk around and I look at the birds. That's what I do. Or I just remember to look up. That's another big one. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. But life is full of adversity. If everything was good all the time, what would, what, you know, what would there be to do? So, yeah, you just have to take the challenges every day, especially with the work as a daily um, um, journey. That, that, is, that, is, that is what this is, you know. So, yeah, okay. I'm excited about the future. Real Food Factory is, is in its growth spurt, which is terrifying as well as very exciting. So, mm -hmm. and. If you are not working, how do you spend your weekends? Uh, I spend my weekends with my fiancé. Uh, he stays on a farm in Wellington. And we are actually busy planting an olive grove at the moment. So, yeah, I'm busy learning everything I can about olives. I've got about four different strains growing to see what's, what's going on. <laughs> yeah, I'm an avid small farmer as well as... Uh, compulsive learner about nature so yeah okay. that's that's my that's my fun at the moment yeah and then obviously I have my two teenagers that I look after as well so yeah they take up a huge amount of energy and yeah time as well of course yeah I can imagine they do take a lot of time they do so they do they're great speaking of teenagers if you could be 20 years old again what message would you give yourself um, I'm actually, yeah, and in, in what, in what, um, which what message would I give myself? Hmm, interesting. I'm not sure how to answer that because I'm pretty proud of the life that I've led. I don't really think I would have done things quite differently, okay. to be honest. So, yeah, I've had quite an extraordinary life, and I'm certainly happy with mm. where I've ended up. So, I'm not sure that I would do things differently and I have done things in quite an extraordinary order. I don't think there is any right way to do it. Would that be the advice that you'll give your teenagers? Oh, my teenagers, yeah, I know they have to get up early, uh, go for a walk, make their bed and get on with it. Yeah, that's their, that's just part of their life. They know that, yeah. Okay, and any plans that they have for the future, planning to go into food manufacturing like their mum um no i think they're traumatized by all their years of working at the markets to be honest with you since they were little little <laughs> so but no they love the food world and uh you know they only they they love to shop at markets and they love they love it, uh, to be part of the journey for sure you know it's been a it's been a excellent way to bring up my children by them seeing uh, the entrepreneurial spirit of the other traders and the whole growth of the food uh, artisan food world in South Africa has been incredible the last 23 mm -hmm. years that I've been involved in it. Um, my son, who's just turned 21, is a little entrepreneur. He's out there in the world doing his thing. And my daughter wants to be a doctor. So, you know, you never, you never know what's going to happen. Let's see. She wouldn't want to go into medicinal plants. Instead of traditional um, medicine? No, I don't. No, I don't think so. I don't think so, no. Because I think somewhere along the line I've read that you have a big interest in the whole medicinal plant. Yes, industry. no, I do. I do as well. That's my other, that's my other big passion. And, um, and some of my early studies were in all the different medicinal plants in South Africa. Um, so, yeah, I've done quite a lot of work on that and found and worked with some interesting it's led to all of my work into 
the superfoods I work with in South Africa and uh, predominantly my work with uh, hemp seeds, the shelled hemp seed, which is a huge product, um, a, a huge ingredient in my product range. Um, so, yeah, I work alongside um, those ingredients. So will there be somewhere apart from superfoods? Will that be something that you might want to go into, explore new avenues or do you think we've reached the limit um well i'm i'm very i'm yeah i'm very involved with the uh the hemp industries and the growth of them obviously i'm a great uh off take for any hemp uh shelled hemp seed that would be grown in south africa and we know the opportunities of growing hemp for oh, the multitude of reasons that it's needed in south africa can only encourage um, uh, jobs and 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 a whole new industry that needs to be set up. So yeah, we're very involved again with government bodies and different people talking, giving talks on how the hemp, yeah, industry and and revolution that needs to happen urgently in this country uh, to grow so many sectors. I need another whole podcast to talk about that as well. Yeah. Just quickly, what is your opinion on the government's take on the whole scenario? Oh, again, like I said, I don't want to give just too much of a harsh opinion. We need to actually get on with it. Um, there is the cannabis industry bill is is now open to comment, and uh, the cannabis bill is also available, but both of them uh, don't show enough allowances for what needs to be done to grow the industry. You know, so and then there, there also isn't a different um, bill for the hemp industry to be getting on with it and, and, and doing its thing. It's all very, very complicated and it needs to be made much simpler. So, yeah, that's my it's, it's, it's a very complicated subject. I need I need a lot more time to give that answer. Yeah. And hopefully or probably need a new government to move on with the whole industry. Well, we need a government that understands that, that, that small and medium enterprise needs to grow, you know, and so whatever industries can be allocated as quickly as possible to do that, well, it needs to be done. So, yeah, it's, 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 it's yeah, whether it's food or, or hemp or any kind of manufacturing, it really needs to, we need, we need, we need more funding sectors and the funding actually needs to get to the right people. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like a big subject to tackle. I think we need to organise a next podcast on that subject. Yeah, but indeed, indeed. Do you, you sound like you're extremely busy. Do you ever get time to read of any books that you can recommend? Um, yes. Um, yeah, I actually, I am reading. Uh, shall I give you three books that I'm reading at the moment? Them um, is uh, The Leader Who Had No Title, Robin Sharma. And the other one is a book called Finish Big by Bo Burlingham. Okay. What is that about? That is about how great entrepreneurs exit their companies on top. And it's very interesting, actually. It's nice that you asked me about this book because... Even though I don't want to exit my company right now, um, I need to be as I in my in my growth. I need to be building a company that I can one day exit. You see, and therefore you need to read about like I've been reading stories in that about Ben and Jerry's ice cream and what happened to them, and to Whole Foods what happened to them. All those stories are kind of in this book, and it's 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 very interesting because in most of these stories the founders don't come out on top in any way, you know? So it, it's good to read these things ahead of time and see, okay, what were their failings? What happened then, you know? And then the other book that I've got is uh, Living the Seven Habits, uh, the Stephen Covey book, yeah, as well. So yeah, yeah, so those are my business books that I'm reading. And then I've got my, my other styles of books that I read as well. Okay, and any inspirational quotes? that you share with all your people that you mentor? Um, no, I just usually, like I say, I actually give more. I don't tend to quote 
people particularly I can send you something I I can't think of something in the moment like I say uh my 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 uh my my mantras are very stoic in their way and that's you know you you know you like I say you you have to get up early in the morning yeah you have to do whatever practice you need to do whether it's a cold water dip whether it's um, the, 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 the meditating whether it's going for a walk whether it's loving your dog whatever it is and just give yourself like 15 minutes of time yeah and then you have to make your bed and then you have to just get on with it you know and most of the time I don't that, 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 that is the formula all these practices are just leading all these quotes are just leading to that formula which is action yeah because if you action things then they happen if you just sit dreaming about them all the time, then they don't happen. Dreaming is great. I dream all the time, all the time, but it's not enough. You need action. You need to action. Yeah, and no I matter think, what. Um, yeah, all these motivational people, um, a lot of entrepreneurial workshops, it's all about to dream and that you're good enough and you can do it, but there's very little action behind it. Indeed, indeed, yeah, no, indeed, indeed. Or there's action until it's really hard and you really don't want to go and then you should even, then, then you really have to, then, 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 the, then the true entrepreneurial spirit comes out, you know, in those moments where you really don't want to show up and you must. So, yeah, that's the difference because even the Richard Branson's, you know, lost lost their business and had to remake it. And even the, you know, every, everyone speaks of it. Every single one of these entrepreneurial books at some point had that moment where they were like, "We're not going to make it. We've lost everything." And and it's the come and it's them doing those three things I keep talking about that 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 made them make it. It wasn't an inspirational quote that made them make it. It wasn't a mentor that made them make it. They did it. The entrepreneur, they did it. Definitely. Very, very wise words there from you. We can see you've had some really experience in this. Um, and you've made it through. Yeah. And you're just growing bigger and better all the time. So hats off to you, Jules. You are indeed very, very inspirational. But thank you, just thank a quick you. and almost as a last question. What would be your metaphorical mountains that you still want to climb in the next three to five years? Okay, yeah, no, well, we have a we have a beautiful uh, plan ahead of us. We're hitting our first uh, international food show at the end of the year, so that's very exciting. And then next, uh, so that's in the UK, and then next year in California. So my product range is uh, about to go into huge diversification with condiments and cooking sauces and all kinds of new beautiful uh, sizes and flavors from the my vegan offering. Um, and then I need to finish my cookbooks. I've got two cookbooks ready to go. So I just need to finish those off with some photography. So that's quite exciting. And then I also want to make a look at making a little uh, documentary about this whole journey of okay. food manufacturing and entrepreneurism. And yeah, there's a few people interested in doing that with me. So yeah. So that's kind of next year. Some nice, exciting projects, some creative or, or a balance of creative as well as product driven, you know, sales excitement. Yeah. Okay. So this is all within the next year. Yeah, this is all within the next year. I mean, it, it's when I say, right, I would say from now to next year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These are already okay. in hand, these things, yeah. Okay. Do you ever work with a five-year plan or a ten-year plan, or is it all just next year? Um, look, the money people work with the five-year plans. In reality, yeah, I would say that any entrepreneur works within a, you know, six-month to one-year to three year plan of reality but definition of entrepreneurism should be adaptability and uh, resilience hey so to plan for everything that comes our way you know one minute it's stage two load shedding the next minute it's stage six load shedding then the water goes out then you can't get gas in south africa then our government's bringing in bombs. Did you see what I mean? It's just, it, 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 it's so, you can have your uh, 
cash flow forecasts and your money plans and your what you need to target and all of that. But as the founder and the entrepreneur and the dreamer, yeah, I think the plans are can be as steadfast as they need to be within a within a realm. But you 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 adapting every every yeah. week every day is the truth of it. You know, you have to. Oh, definitely. Yeah, maybe it's not the same in the UK, but here for sure. Yeah, and maybe it's not the same if you're not a food manufacturer, but I think it pretty much is, to be honest, you know, even in even in your world, you know, yeah. Absolutely. Jules, you've mentioned um, South Africa and the UK and London a couple of times. Would you ever consider going back to the UK? No, definitely not. Absolutely, definitely not. No, no. Any specific reason? Um, because I can't really make enough change there. I want to uh, manufacture here at the mothership and we're growing South Africa and we're growing our economy and then they can buy it there. They have uh, uh, much more infrastructure and, yeah, ability to buy the products there. So, yeah, I think it's a good place. And we have this beautiful story of the Londoner who's really trying to, yeah, <clears throat> leave some kind of legacy behind here and you know yeah create a, a journey for South Africans yeah I can make much more of a difference here so to go back to London now would would to me be ah yeah it, it, it just it's just not going to happen okay we definitely need more entrepreneurs like yourself who are firmly behind South Africa and committed and not having exit plans along the way. Yeah, please, I agree with you. Absolutely, absolutely. I get incredibly disappointed when I hear people are leaving. I mean, I understand, but I also get incredibly disappointed. At the end of the day, we all live within the expansion of money that we have. So when you'll go there and you set up in pounds and the pounds seem all so much if you convert it to rands, but now you're living in pounds and it's not all the dream in the UK in any way in any way i know i grew up there so yeah i know jules thank yeah. you so much for your time and good luck with everything on your side thank you for giving this opportunity to um to to talk to me um and yeah to talk about real food factory and its journey i know it's been a short amount of time but yeah thank you thank you so much for having us mm -hmm.